This is the tale of Bullets from the Farmhouse, the wrongful conviction of Charles Stilo and Nelson Green over a century ago in upstate New York for a double homicide in Orleans County. Uh, they, uh, the murder occurred on a the property of a farmhouse. This is kind of what it would look like. This was not the actual property, but it was a. This is a similar kind of farmhouse arrangement from the period. Uh, there was a, a farmhouse where the owner Charles Phelps and his housekeeper Margaret Walcott lived, and then not too far away there was a tenant house. We can see behind my head. Um, this might be a part of the barn, but it also. For, let's just imagine that's a tenant house, and in the tenant house is where Steele lived with his family. So this is Charles Phelps. He was born in 1844. This was in 1915, so he was roughly 70, 71 years old at this time. He was a well-known, well-respected, uh, well-liked uh, landowner in the uh, in, or in Orleans County. For whatever reason, he had chosen to withdraw thousands of dollars in cash from the bank around this time, and he had taken the wad of bills, which would have been, you know, like hundreds of thousands, maybe, I don't know, inflation, millions of dollars potentially, that he had put into his uh, dresser, uh, which wasn't exactly hiding it. And uh, that act, I don't know why he did that, but he did, in fact, uh, do that. And that's what led to the burglary and then his murder. This is Charles Stilo. Charles Stilo, or Charlie, as he was sometimes called, lived in the tenant house. He had been hired March 15th, just about a week before the murders, and moved into the tenant house with his family, with his, his wife, um, with their two small children, a son and a daughter, uh, with his wife's mother, and with his wife's brother. So Nelson Green was that brother. So Nelson Green, the other defendant in this case, was the brother-in-law to Charles Stilo. Stilo uh, and Green were both illiterate. They were not well-spoken men. They were, um, uh, uh, Green and, uh, uh, and Stilo were kind of heavy set men. Stilo, every, all the uh, uh, discussion of him is that he was a big guy, big hands, big feet, everything about him was big, but he was a gentleman. He was not ever in trouble with anybody or anything at the time that these murders occurred. There was no reason not to trust him implicitly as the tenant farmer for Charles Phelps. There was another uh, man, however, in the town. This was an itinerant peddler by the name of Irving King. King also had uh, another associate. Uh, they, those two of them, uh, it later came out when King confessed, uh, had learned about the fact that Phelps had taken money out of the bank and had stored it somewhere on the property out uh, at their farm, at the farm. And uh, King and his associate had decided that they were going to go and uh, uh, burglarize the farm and take the money. King says that he didn't believe that they there was going to be any bloodshed that night, that they were just going to go in, find the money and leave, and that would be the end of it. According to his story, that's not exactly what happened, however. So on a, a night where there was snow on the ground around the farmhouse, so they actually left footprints in the snow uh, uh, around the farmhouse as they approached it, they uh, went in. They were actually then confronted by Phelps for whatever reason, whether he was up. It wasn't that late as far as we would be concerned, 10 or 11 at night. Um, many people would have gone to bed at this point, at this time in history, uh, but Phelps, for whatever reason, uh, either heard them or whatever confronted them, uh, they uh, hit him and uh, it is said shot him. And uh, King says that it was his accomplice, Clarence O'Connell, who actually was the trigger man, actually the gunman, who shot Phelps one time at this point. Now, at that point, Margaret Walcott must have heard the commotion. Uh, she sees what happens. She rushes out of the farmhouse and uh, they wind, she winds up getting shot through the window. So uh, according to King's account, what happened then is O'Connell shot the gun through the window. It hits Margaret Walcott uh, below her, her left shoulder, basically must have hit her in the heart. Um, this is when things get a little bit strange in terms of some of the stories that are told. A neighbor who could not have lived that close by says that she heard four shots and she also heard 
uh, Miss Walcott yell out. And what she said Miss Walcott yelled was, Charlie, let me in. I've been shot. Uh, or something like, I'm dying. I'm dying. Let me in. And which is really interesting for her to have said. this. So um, uh, this really isn't uh, inculpatory for Charlie Stilo, right? Because why would she have called out for help to her murderer? And why would she have expected Charlie Stilo to be in his house if he was, uh, you know, invading the main house trying to burglarize it? So the neighbor's account was very much discounted by everybody involved, including people who were advocates for Charles Stilo, uh, because like, how could the neighbor have heard this? And what she heard doesn't sound real. Now, on the other hand, if it's true that Irving King uh, what, and his associate were the ones who had done this murder, it kind of makes sense. Maybe it, maybe it is exactly what happened. Uh, but anyway, she, uh, Miss Walcott flees the house, she gets shot and uh, uh, at this point, uh, Stilo and Green do hear something outside. Now, they were already asleep. Now, they were farm laborers, both of them, and so it would have been normal for them to be asleep at this point. Uh, uh, so they got up, they looked out the window, did not see anything, went back to bed. Uh, which, you know, obviously was not the most ideal situation. Back at the farmhouse, uh, uh, Mr. Phelps, uh, regained consciousness, and at that point, O'Connell shot him two more times, according to Irving King. And and uh, then they ransacked the house, looking for the money. They found it in the dresser, took the money, and fled, presumably to a stream nearby and then beyond. So uh, that was that was the story of what happened, as far as we know, at the farmhouse that night. Uh, the next morning. Uh, Charles Stilo gets up at 5 a.m., gets ready to go out, goes out to work the farm, discovers the body of Miss, o of, of Miss Walcott on the porch of the tenant house. She is, she's dead by then, uh, 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 presumably having bled out from the wound that was in her heart. And then she uh, is, is left there. He investigates at the main house, finds Charles Phelps. He is not yet dead. And then he uh, uh, runs uh, off to call the police. They arrive not long after. Um, uh, Mr. Phelps is brought to medical attention. He was uh, unconscious. He never did regain consciousness, and he died that day. So uh, that's so there was a, there was a double homicide. Not long after that, uh, you had you know the rest of the town. Basically, this was a huge uh, impact on this tiny little town. This is what Albion, New York looks like uh, today. I imagine it's not too terrible. I doubt if they had the stoplights and, and, and these cars on the street at the time, but it, it probably, it probably the main street hasn't changed a whole lot in the last hundred years, I bet. And, uh, and, and so this sleepy little village in uh, Albion is the county seat. Um, uh, the, the authorities uh, are, were very, very well trusted. I'll tell you that that the, there's a dynamic here that happened in this case where the, the people in the county trusted the police and the prosecutor enormously, and they really, really were uh, saddened by the death of Mr. Phelps. And as a result, they, they were very, very sympathetic to, uh, uh, to the authorities when they solved this case by fingering Stilo and Green. And uh, they never changed and wavered in that support for the authorities in Orleans County in that regard. And who, who were the authorities? Now, this is a cartoon actually from the Baltimore Star, uh, again, from almost this exact time uh, of, of a prosecutor and a, and a police officer. I don't have a picture of the two. The, the, the prosecutor, the district attorney, was Mr. Knickerbocker. John C. Knickerbocker was the uh, district attorney, and he arrived at the Phelps farmhouse uh, that morning. The, this would have been the morning of March 22nd, and uh, quickly called in bloodhounds. Um, so at this point in time, you know, the district, the district attorney was almost like, he was the chief law enforcement officer of the county, so he took charge of the investigation quite directly. So they call in a dog, uh, interestingly, Charles Stilo 
uh, it is said, pet the dog, and then the dog liked Char Charlie Stilo. Um, uh, the dog was put on the scent uh, associated with the footsteps, did not uh, uh, hit against Stilo or Green. Uh, so as far as this, the, the, the dog was concerned, Stilo and Green were innocent. Now, uh, uh, and then the, what the dog did was it, it sniffed and sniffed and tracked the scent to the stream and then lost the scent. So the, the bloodhound really was not, didn't, didn't help much. Um, and it's very likely if the dog handler let the dog smell Stilo, who could well have been a suspect, and hang out with Stilo before or after this event, I mean, it's kind of weird. Uh, it doesn't sound like very good dog handling practices. But one thing that's said that happens over and over in this case is the standards that we expect today just were not followed in 1915, okay? And so they just, the, the dog handler was not probably, doesn't sound like, as careful uh, in serving John Knickerbocker as, uh, as, as should be. Knickerbocker, again, this was an unusual practice, decided to hire some detectives. The Orleans County wouldn't have had uh, a detective for us on hand to investigate a double homicide. It's very common for a rural town at that time to uh, commercially hire a detective agency. And they uh, hired John Newton, who had the Newton um, Detective Agency, uh, to come in and, uh, actually, I'm sorry, George Newton, to come in and investigate the case. And Newton worked on contingency. In other words, Newton would only be paid if he solved the case. And so he was very highly motivated to solve the case, right? Because that's when he would get paid. The good commercial arrangement, I'm not sure it's good criminal justice arrangement because it kind of predisposed Newton to find the easiest suspect uh, and nail that person uh, to the ground for the murders. Uh, and that's kind of what happened. So um, uh, Newton went around interviewing people. He interviewed Stilo and Green and Stilo and Green said, we didn't do it. We don't even have any firearms. We don't even have any firearms in the house, which is an odd thing for them to have said. Uh, one thing that Newton found is after the autopsy was done, there they, he found that there were uh, 22 caliber bullets. There were three 22 caliber bullets that were found in Phelps, in Charles Phelps, and one 22 caliber bullet found in the body of Margaret Walcott. Those four bullets wound up being very, very important in the case. And, uh, and it, so it was clear that uh, uh, they were shot with some kind of 22 caliber firearm. Uh, now, the assumption was that it was a revolver. I'm not sure why they came to that assumption, but we'll, we'll go into that here in a minute. One thing that then happened is Newton started to decide, well, I'm going to start searching around in likely suspects. And of course, the first suspect would have been Stilo. And when searching the home, they found two firearms, both 22 caliber. One was a revolver, the other was a rifle, a 22 caliber rifle. Um, and uh, at that point, of course, that was in highly incriminatory that Stilo and, and Green had said they didn't have any firearms. And in fact, the one type of firearm they had, both of them were 22 calibers, which could have been the, 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 the murder weapons. Uh, within a, a day or two of that discovery, uh, Newton, arrested Stilo and Green, and they would remain in custody for several years while this case wound its way through the, the, the courts and, uh, and, and a lot, a lot of media attention as well. The other thing Newton did was he brought in Albert Hamilton, and I believe I have Mr. Hamilton. Here he is. Mr. Hamilton was a self-described criminal, cr criminalist or criminologist, um, he w said that he was an expert in medicine and many other fields. One of the things he said was that he was an expert in ballistics and in, in, in firearms. And he said that he would do the comparison. And uh, so he never did a test fire, but what he did was he, he took uh, photographs of the four bullets and he examined the Stilo firearms and he concluded that indeed it was a revolver, that the 22 caliber revolver owned by Charlie Stilo was the murder weapon, was the weapon that had fired the bullets that were found at autopsy in the bodies of Charles Phelps and Miss Walcott. 
And as a result, that was extraordinarily damning evidence. Um, and uh, now the problem being is that me Hamilton's methods were not reliable. I mean, like I said, he didn't do any test fires. He said he found nine scratches on the bullets that matched imperfections or irregularities in the barrel of the firearm. But the question as to what that actually was a match to was never really ever established. Uh, Hamilton, though, a media account at the time said he used a lot of $2 words. Which was a way of saying he was a, he was a fancy high flutin guy. He he loved to, to give very very fancy descriptions and and bowl you over with his supposed technical know how. But he wasn't really uh, as sophisticated as he made out to be, uh, or as much of an expert as he made out to be. Um, uh, so um, so so that that incriminating evidence was was then reinforced the the, the firearms. Newton. Uh, uh, then uh, coerced a confession uh, out of Charles Stilo. Now, uh, Newton uh, uh, says, and Knickerbocker supports, that there were multiple witnesses to Stilo's confession, and that Stilo made a detailed confession that fit the facts of the crime as they knew them at, the, at, the, at that point. And, um, but, and so they, they, uh, the, there was a written out confession, and uh, Stilo, though, refused to sign the confession. He said, that's wrong, it's false, that's not true. Uh, and so uh, from the get-go here, we see where the problem lies, right? So there was this coerced confession, this really what, what wound up being clearly a false confession. And I'll tell you why here in a little bit as the, as this, as the story develops. Um, uh, and that was unsigned, but was witnessed by these leading figures like Knickerbocker, and Newton. So like what, what was really going on here? This was enough though for them to go to trial. So they went to trial in Orleans County. Uh, they had Hamilton go, uh, you know, uh, testify about these nine scratches uh, uh, and they also presented the confession testimony. It was recognized that the confession was at least somewhat coerced. And the judge had a hearing about the admission of the confession testimony, decided to admit it, and then allow both the prosecution and defense to talk about all the circumstances around the confession. And so uh, in that sense, the confession was the key evidence, more than the ballistics were. But Hamilton also presented the ballistics. The defense was successful in questioning it to some degree because the nine scratches Hamilton referred to weren't visible in the picture. And Hamilton talked around that with his $2 words and as it, and said, basically, oh, I took a picture of the other side. These are pictures of the other side of the bullets. But, you know, I'm an expert. You wouldn't be able to see those scratches in these photographs unless you were an expert. And uh, so Hamilton kind of got away with that. And, um, uh, but it was, uh, but the defense did a decent job in this particular case of calling into question the validity of that ballistics uh, testimony. Uh, what then happened is that the judge at the end of the trial turned to the jury and, and said, you know what, if you don't believe the confession, then you have to acquit. He said, if, if it weren't for the confession, I'd end this trial right now and send Stilo and Green, or else Stilo was actually on trial on his own. Green was held in jail. He wasn't in, um, for trial yet. So I would, I'd, tell, I'd send Mr. Stilo home innocent because there's not enough evidence here. The only thing really that's that's that's, that you can rely on is the confession. So if you don't believe the confession, you got to let Stilo off. Uh, Stilo, for his part, he testified in the trial, and he said, "I didn't have anything to do with it. I don't know what was going on. I don't know what you know. This is not me." Um, and uh, very clearly protested his his innocence. The jury retired uh, for just a few hours, came back with a guilty verdict for first degree murder for Charles Stilo. Um, that, at that time, that meant that he was uh, the, he was up for execution for capital punishment and was sent to Sing Sing Prison. Now, this is what Sing Sing Prison had as a newfangled piece of equipment at that time. They had actually uh, uh, built a fancy new electric chair at uh, Sing Sing Prison in 1915, right at the time that uh, Charles Stilo had been convicted. So Stilo was sent to Sing Sing Prison to await execution uh, uh, 
uh, in September of that year. Now he, over this period of time, over the over the next year or so, um, would face four different uh, uh, dates for execution. And in fact, at one point, came within a single hour of of being executed before getting a a stay for a few weeks. Um, also, at different points during this whole saga, there were ten different judges who reconsidered the case, and all of them decided that uh, they would not order a new trial in the Stilo in the Stilo case. And um, so, so he was he was really in a bad way, bad situation. Uh, Nelson Green, for his part, um, decided to take a plea deal after Stilo had been convicted and sentenced to death. So at that point, Nelson Green uh, uh, pled guilty to second degree murder and was sentenced to 20 years to life. When uh, Stilo got to Sing Sing, he was actually kind of surprised uh, because first the inmates on death row really liked him. They thought he was innocent and they were very, very supportive of them. There's two stories I'll tell you about that. One is that uh, they supported him so much that they passed the hat, along with the prison officials actually, um, to raise money. They raised $42 for him so that his family could come and visit him the night before he was to be executed. And in fact, they did. Um, they were able to do that uh, on uh, the one execution where he came within an hour of dying. Um, uh, they had visited him the, the pre previous night because the prisoners had, had contributed to the fund to allow them to come visit. It was pretty cool in its own you know, amazing way. Um, they also, when eventually he was exonerated, uh, held a dance party and they made dummies out of their bed clothes and bed linens and that kind of thing. And they danced with the dummies and had a good old hoedown, apparently, um, celebrating uh, Charles Stilo's exoneration uh, when, that, when that happened several years down the, down the road. Uh, more importantly for his ultimate fate, the prison officials also uh, became convinced of Stilo's innocence. Uh, they had done a, a little mini investigation of their own. Uh, they had reviewed the confession. It's clear to them that Stilo, being a person with uh, uh, the IQ of an eight-year-old uh, of uh, as an adult, uh, uh, in terms of how he was tested, uh, completely illiterate, spoke in monosyllables, seldom said more than two or three words at a time, and the confession, just like uh, Hamilton's testimony, was full of $2 words. It was way fancier than anything he would ever have said, and he definitely could not have written it. He just was not capable of uh, writing anything, hardly. And so, um, and, in fact, one of the stories is, is that to pass the time, this man who was, who was fit and strong, he gained a lot of weight in prison, uh, to pass the time, he would he he taught himself to make his signature. That's that's basically where the, the the level of his education had been. The prison officials became becoming convinced. They they talked to different folks and they wound up finding some advocates for him. And that's these three men uh, who ran something called the Humanitarian Cult in New York City. And I, that's actually the name, the Humanitarian Cult. Um, it was only extant, I think, for a few years uh, around World War I time period, um, and uh, they became advocates for Charles Stilo in the greater New York community. And they wrote letters to government officials and lawyers and people to try to gen up support uh, for Stilo's case and to the, and getting the newspapers involved as well. Uh, the key person though they didn't really do that much for him, frankly, other than call attention to it. The person whose attention they got, though, was this extraordinary lady who, if you don't know who this is, you probably have never heard of her, but you should, because uh, she is one of the most, uh, she's one of two heroes of this story, at least, um, and the one who uh, believed uh, uh, Stilo first in terms of somebody who could actually do something about it. Uh, her name was Grace... Humiston. And as you can see, this is a book uh, that was written, this is actually a recent book, uh, maybe 2000, 2010s, it was written in the 2010s, 
about her. The media had dubbed her Mrs. Sherlock Holmes. This was after the Stilo Green case that she, she got that reputation uh, because of other murders that she was involved in the investigation of. Uh, she has the distinction of being the first woman to be an assistant U.S. attorney uh, in the uh, office of the Department of Justice uh, in the United States, which is a, an extraordinary distinction. She became convinced of Stilo's uh, innocence based on the confession and began to investigate it. She really saw that there was a difference between what Stilo could have said and what the confession said. And she really thought that Newton himself was the culprit in this whole case. And she decided she was going to entrap them. And so with the help of the humanitarian cult, she contacted Newton under the ruse that she wanted to hire him. I think it was to like investigate her husband or some other kind of story that she gave him. And she, um, so he came to New York to, for the interview to be considered for the job. And uh, the Stilo Green case, of course, came up. And she's like, well, how did you get that confession? That was really amazing work. How'd that, how'd that happen? And, um, uh, and Newton, being the super genius that he was, to, proceeded to give her the whole rundown. He told her everything. He had beaten Stilo. He had strangled Stilo. Uh, he had written the confession for Stilo. Uh, and... Uh, and the whole nine yards. Now, a lot of this came out because of Humiston in the media, in the newspapers of the time. And afterward, John Knickerbocker, the district attorney, was really angry about it. He believed that the confession, or at least he says that he believed that the confession was genuine. And, uh, and he actually filed a civil lawsuit against those who held that uh, he had been a party to uh, this this official misconduct on the false confession. Now he did not. He eventually dropped that lawsuit for whatever reasons we don't know. But um, in any case, he definitely protested that the uh, Stilo confession was genuine. Uh, Grace Humiston, having found this, she raised this with the governor and with the judicial authorities. This was one of the times when uh, uh, there was a stay of execution. Uh, for uh, Stilo, but uh, nobody uh, decided the courts would not uh, grant him a new trial on the basis of this kind of hearsay that she had gotten from Newton, and the governor didn't want to overrule the courts. So uh, Governor, governor Whitman really monitored this case fairly closely from this point forward, but he was very, very reluctant to overrule the courts. So uh, Grace Humiston, because of the stay, had a few extra weeks that she could try to investigate the case, she winds up tracking down Irving King. And um, uh, because she had heard that there was an itinerant peddler matching King's description in, uh, in, in Orleans County at the time of the murder. And King, as it happens, had just been arrested for burglary in a different county in New York. She goes up to that county meets with him along with some of her friends and gets him to confess to the murders uh, of, of Phelps and Walcott. And he gives the whole whole description, including O'Connell, putting uh, incriminating O'Connell as the shooter and everything. He does not sign a written confession at this point. And this becomes important. Newton then is sent out by Orleans County to pick up um, uh, King and bring him back to Orleans County to be interviewed officially, basically. And so they ride in the car, apparently, for a couple of hours. It was like 100 miles between the two places. And uh, after that car ride, King uh, recants, says, I didn't do any confession. That woman manipulated me or abused me or whatever it is, and says, that's the end of it. And, um, and so Newton, uh, for whatever reason, I don't know, maybe he, he impressed upon King the gravity of the situation. Maybe he convinced King to recant. We don't really know what happened at, at that point. So uh, what did happen, though, interestingly, is uh, another uh, uh, hero comes into the case. So um, the governor, after the last... Uh, the 10th judge turns down Stilo's appeals. 
uh, decides that he's going to get to the bottom of things because this is just too, there's just too much uncertainty, especially with there's now being potentially another confession in the case. So he brings in this guy, George Hopkins Bond. Uh, Bond had been a, a lawyer in uh, New York, upstate New York, for a number of years. He went to Syracuse University. He was on the football team. He actually coached the Syracuse University football team in 1894, and um, would continue for another another 40 years to serve uh, the state of New York. His son, actually, uh, George Bond Jr., would carry on that legacy for another generation as well. So for a very, very long time afterward. Bond was uh, given a $25,000 appropriation by Governor Hamilton to investigate this and determine whether there was anything to the potential innocence of, George, of, of Charles Stilo. And uh, Bond did exactly that. Uh, he did several different things. Uh, one is that he looked at the photographs and and did another analysis of the foot uh, uh, marks, the footprints, outside the Phelps farmhouse from that night and demonstrated very clearly that uh, Stilo could not have made the, fo the, the, fo the footprints. Stilo's foot was too big uh, to make the, the footprints in the snow and, and therefore there must have been some other uh, strangers uh, that that were were on the farm property that night. So that's that's fact number one. The other thing is that um, he found some incriminating letters that King wrote. So King went was sent back to serve time for the burglary that he was arrested for, and he started writing letters to all of his friends and buddies, He's, and including people who, somebody who had actually hidden the money. And he's like, don't incriminate me. You're going to send me to the chair because of this murder I did. You know, he wrote several different incriminating letters. Bond found those letters and, they, you know, they were very, very damning. The other thing that Bond did was he found recordings. So there was actually this. This, this is the, 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 There was voice recording capability at the time. He found dictograph recordings, hours of dictograph recordings of Newton's interrogation of Stilo and Green. It did not demonstrate that the confessions were terribly coerced. It did demonstrate that Stilo and Green never said anything incriminating during that entire interview. Everything that was recorded was uh, very undamning. In fact, it was very innocent. He also found uh, when, when Stilo was in jail, um, uh, they had actually arranged to put another detective in the, the prison cell with him, in the jail cell with him while he was under arrest, but before he had confessed, in the hopes of getting him to say something to this investigator. And the investigator posed as a wild man, criminal type guy, and obviously didn't tell Stilo what was going on, spent almost three weeks in, in the jail cell with Stilo, using every trick in the book, came away convinced Stilo was innocent. Stilo never said anything incriminating during this whole time. Bond had dug this guy up and, and found, the, found this guy, uh, which clearly believed that Stilo was innocent as well. And then finally, the, the real interesting thing from our perspective is he brought in Charles Waite and his friend, uh, uh, Calvin Goddard. And uh, so this was actually really, really important uh, from our perspective as people who care about forensic science. So Charles Waite was kind of an assistant investigator who worked with, uh, with Mr. Bond. And um, Calvin Goddard um, uh, and he uh, did test fires of the weapons. This is actually, these are actually from another case that they worked. These are the cartridge casings from the Sanko and Vanzetti case that they worked a good 20 years later. At this time though, neither one of them was a ballistics expert but they um, uh, put together a, a procedure that they were going to use. Wade had some experience, but, they, but not really in the sense of, of being properly trained ballistics experts because there was no such thing at the time. So uh, the, they put together a procedure and they brought in an, uh, uh, an optical expert by the name of Max Poser. Poser had actually developed, this was around the time of the Great War, World War I, and Poser had actually developed methods for visualizing brain injuries uh, for soldiers who had been injured on the battlefield. And Poser helped them put together a, a, um, uh, some micro microscopic t uh, equipment to examine the bullets from, from 
uh, from the case. And they did some test fires as well and clearly demonstrated that the Stilo gun was not the gun that fired the bullets that killed uh, Phelps and Walcott. And uh, of course, given that this was the thread that originated the whole mess, uh, the fact that those firearms were not involved in the murder was really, really important. He made an extraordinarily detailed report that I don't have, unfortunately. I would love to get that report um, to the governor about this and then went to Orleans County to a grand jury, spent two weeks, um, Bond did, presenting to the grand jury all of this evidence that was exonerating uh, Charles Stilo. The grand jury declined to recommend an appeal for Charles Stilo. And uh, so that was it. <laughs> because the grand jury was made up of local Orleans County people who just, they, they, they believed that Knickerbocker was correct. They were willing to support him. They, they still had a lot of sympathy for Phelps and Walcott, believing, you know, that they were, ter they were terrible victims here and, um, uh, and, and felt that Stilo and Green were guilty and that these highfalutin city folk were trying to pull one over on them. And uh, so the governor, uh, Governor Whitman at that time, uh, did review the case, including review that uh, ballistics work from uh, Calvin Goddard and Charles Waite and uh, decided that the, in the interest of justice that uh, Stilo's uh, uh, conviction should be commuted and he should be released from prison not soon after that, not too long after that. He did the same for Nelson Green. And it is said, uh, they, not, neither one of them got any compensation, but it is said that they uh, both were... Um, uh, very um, uh, well received back in the community after they had um, been exonerated and and, and uh, pardoned by the governor, and that they continued to live in Buffalo for a long time uh, afterward. And what's really amazing is this is actually a picture of Calvin Goddard with a um, uh, with a comparison microscope. This is what a comparison microscope is. Goddard and Waite wound up working with uh, Philip Gravel. Uh, and other scientists to develop the comparison microscope. They developed the modern standards for ballistic comparison. They were inspired by the wrongful convictions of uh, Stilo and Green to really reform, uh, uh, really create the uh, ballistic identification as we know it today. The comparison microscope is still used in ballistic identification today. And um, uh, uh, what's also interesting is that out of this, Calvin Goddard actually, and wait, they started training um, uh, uh, cops, police officers, in how to, how to do this kind of ballistic identification. It came to the attention of the FBI and J. Edgar Hoover, who was the director of the FBI, Hoover said, I want all of my people to go to, at that point, Chicago is where they had the training academy and learn what Waite and Goddard have created. And uh, that had such an impact that Hoover then followed up. For my money, Calvin Goddard was the founder of the FBI laboratory. I don't know whether he's officially considered that, but in any case, Hoover brought in Goddard. Uh, Goddard had enormous influence over, over the establishment of the FBI laboratory roughly uh, a decade after the Stilo and Green wrongful conviction. And uh, so out of this amazing like little town, double homicide, farmhouse in Orleans County and these poor illiterate men who were fingered for it unfairly came uh, the modern field of ballistics identification came the FBI laboratory which wound up being the model for crime laboratories uh, in, in America uh, across law enforcement agencies for the next hundred years so it was an, an amazingly impactful case and I hope that uh, you enjoyed hearing about it as much as I enjoyed uh, learning about it. And uh, that is Charles Stilo and Nelson Green. And uh, thank you to uh, Miss Humiston. And thank you to Mr. Bond and to uh, Mr. Waite, uh, Mr. Goddard, and all the others who were so, in, and, and the humanitarian cult, who were so instrumental in uh, attaining justice in the Stilo and Green case.